Uh, good morning, members of the board. Uh, like uh, Megan said, uh, my name is Finn McCall. I'm the uh, Division of Boating and Ocean Recreation Engineering Branch Head. Um, I've been uh, kind of managing this project for Pohoiki for the last few years. Uh, the main purpose of this board briefing, uh, this being a, a non-decision making item, is we wanted to present to the board um, some various project alternatives we're looking at at Pohoiki. In 2018, um, as you all know, we had the uh, the eruption on the Big Island at the Kilauea uh, Lower East Rift Zone. Uh, during the eruption and also following the end of the eruption, um, a lot of black sand and lava debris started filling in Pohoiki Bay and ended up blocking off the uh, entrance channel um, for the Pohoiki boat ramp, making uh, ocean access from that boat ramp inaccessible. Um, when we first started uh, working on this project, um, you know, material had, had been continuing to kind of accumulate in the bay. And, and our first approach was that we would need to look into um, alternative boat ramp sites um, because it, it appeared that uh, we would continue to have this infilling of material in the bay. And we started moving in that direction. Um, and we, we did a study uh, in June of 2019 to look at alternative boat ramp sites along the, uh, the Puna coastline. And there really aren't very many options there uh, just because of the, the high rocky sea cliff nature of the coastline and just the difficulty with constructing a boat ramp in those conditions. Um, and you combine that with the rough ocean conditions out there uh, makes it for a very difficult way to construct a boat ramp um, along that coastline. You know, we had anticipated that we would need to do an environmental impact statement to um, analyze the various uh, locations that we're looking at and um, the design alternatives. And um, before we did that, we met with uh, various members of the community, the fishermen, um, boaters, and just the local community to get their input on um, you know, what they believe to be you know, the best solution, um, given they're the ones who use the boat ramp. So after meeting with the community, it became pretty clear to us that um, that Pohoiki really um, Pohoiki Bay really offers the most unique location along that coastline. It has the natural protective features that uh, protect um, the bay from you know the rough ocean conditions. We decided to look closer at focusing more on on uh, Pohoiki Bay itself. We, we decided to kind of shift gears and, and at that time, you know, um, as time went by, we had also observed that the, um, the material that had been accumulating in the bay had essentially kind of stopped accumulating and, and been pushing its way and being eroded more further to the south, which um, appeared to um, be a good sign that, um, that if we just dredged out um, the uh, the material that's there excavated the material that's above ground um we could possibly just reopen the boat ramp and and that would be the, the most expedient solution possible we essentially geared our focus toward pohoiki bay itself and we developed three alternative projects um for work at pohoiki bay so these are the the project alternatives we're looking at for this board briefing um the first project being what I spoke of before, this is um, what we're calling the Pohoiki Boat Ramp Excavation and Dredging Project. Um, that, would, that would be um, the most expedient means of, of reopening ocean access. Um, second project, and this um, would likely uh, be a follow-up to the Excavation and Dredging Project. This is what we're calling the Pohoiki Boat Ramp Entrance Channel Improvements Project. I'll go into a little more detail on each of these projects in the next slides. And then the third alternative is construction of a whole new boat ramp facility um, along the north side of the harbor um, on the newly formed lava that's there. So the first project, the Pohiki boat ramp excavation and dredging, um, we're looking at uh, excavation. And when we talk about excavation, we're talking about removal of the material that accumulated above sea level. So we're estimated about 
10,000 cubic yards of uh, black sand and lava debris within the, the existing or the previous entrance channel and turning basin material that's above sea level. And once that material is removed, um, uh, you, we proceed to the dredging portion, which is everything below sea level. And we estimate about 5,000 cubic yards of material. Uh, these quantities might change um, depending on you know what the final surveying uh, shows, but these, these are just ballpark figures. And once all that material is removed from the entrance channel, um, the plan is to spread it out along the south side of the beach um, along Pohoiki Bay. Um, in terms of uh, environmental review requirements, uh, there are um, the Department of Land and Natural Resources has um, environmental assessment exemptions that um, we believe is possible that we could use. Um, and these are subject to the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers determining that we're covered under their nationwide permit program. Our estimated construction cost is about 2.5 million. Again, that, that may change depending on the final design and permitting requirements. And we estimate a timeline of approximately nine months. Um, next, and here's a, uh, an image. Uh, this was included in the exhibits with the board's middle. So the red lines show the uh, approximate limits of the excavation and dredging and the uh, yellow area is where we would stockpile the uh, material that we remove from the channel. The next project uh, is what we're calling the Pohiki Bow Ramp Entrance Channel Improvements Project. And this would essentially be a follow-up project to the excavation and dredging, um, whereby we uh, were installing, proposing to install uh, permanent containment structures um, on either side of the entrance channel to keep it from shoaling in, um, from keep it from filling back in from all the sand and, and debris on either side of the channel. Um, we're also uh, including a proposed swim area in there, and that was something that um, the community and, and legislators had had wanted in the past at Pohoiki. Um, we uh, we anticipate that a preparation of an environmental assessment would be required for that project um, due to the you know the installation of new permanent structures, and uh, we estimate a construction cost of approximately six million. Um, uh, timeline for that project is about two to three years, um, or could be more, pending availability of funds. Um, currently, uh, we don't have funds available. Uh, in that amount to do that project, but there are funds available um, to do the excavation and dredging, and I'll touch on that toward the end of the presentation here. So here's here's an image of a concept that we developed um, for uh, the entrance channel improvements. Um, again, this this may be subject to change depending on uh, what the final design is, um, but this is just one concept where we um, drive in sheet piles and uh, secure them with uh, vertical um, concrete piles to hold the sheet piles in place. And um, that would keep the entrance channel from filling back in. The third project that we're looking at would be construction of a whole new boat ramp facility. Um, and this would be on the north side of the harb uh, north side of the bay. Again, um, this is pending availability of funds. Um, so this would require excavation into the new lava um, below sea level to create a turning basin and entrance channel, uh, construction of a new stub breakwater um, uh, going out into the water from where the newly formed lava is, um, and then of course construction of the boat ramp and loading dock within that excavated area um, with a trailer turnaround and parking area um, right next to it. And for this project, just due to the, uh, the large nature of the scope of work, we anticipate that preparation of an environmental impact statement would be required. Our uh, cost estimate for construction is 28 million for this project. And we estimate a timeline of approximately five to six years or more uh, pending uh, availability of funds. And so here's a, uh, an image of the uh, proposed improvements um, with, the, with the access road and uh, turning trailer to the around area, the uh, turning basin, entrance channel, boat ramp, loading dock, and stub breakwater structure. 
There was 500,000 allocated from the legislature to prepare what was described as a feasibility study. Um, and this was, uh, these funds were issued at the time when we were still trying to determine if other uh, locations for a new boat ramp was, was, um, was applicable. Um, these funds we anticipate uh, can be used also for permitting and design for the various project alternatives. Uh, there's also been uh, 1,500,000 allocated from the legislature, and uh, the, this is described as to prepare plans, design, and construction. And if we're able to use the 500,000 we already have um, for design and permitting, um, we may be able to use all of this 1.5 million for construction. And in addition to this, um, funding is available from FEMA for the disaster relief uh, efforts. Um, and FEMA can cover up to 75% of eligible costs. And of course, this is uh, subject to FEMA's approval of the project scope of work. Uh, Aloha Mai Kako, Chairperson Suzanne Case and members of the Board of Land Astro Resources. O Leila Ke Aloha Ko'u Inoa no Puna Mayao. I am Leila Ke Aloha and I'm from Puna. I um, wanted to say thank you very much for taking the time today to listen to our testimony. I'm a third generation Levi who has fished out of Pohiki boat ramp for sustenance, subsistence, and my livelihood. Our families depend on this boat ramp to feed our families. We were taught growing up that you would never go to someone else's place to gather if you did not ask first. You would stay in your own ahupua and don't go maho at anyone else's place. Now our Levi are having to go all the way to Hilo to launch and spending insurmountable costs for fishing. We are hungry. Lower Puna is home to many prize fishing grounds for generations of our families. We have thrived in feeding our families with fish, limu, opihi, and many other things from our ocean backyard. Pohoiki is and has been the only boat ramp between Hilo and Punalu for decades. The distance between these two boat ramps are about 100 miles and there is no current access in between. So it is time to help us get our Levaya back into the ocean in our home waters of Puna. This is our ice box. Our inherent customary practices are being compromised because we're unable to launch from Pohoiki boat ramp. How are we supposed to pass on these traditions to our kupuna if we can't get into the ocean on our own aina? The 2018 killer eruption disrupted many of our lives and we're still in eruption recovery. It has hindered our ability to be sustainable fishermen and farmers and it has affected many of our livelihoods. Pohoiki was known as the, uh, being the third highest producing boat ramp in the state. Help us feed our families again. The safety issues along our coastline are imperative. There are no ocean safety beacons along our Puna coastline currently. According to the U.S. Coast um, Guard, Auxiliary Kumukahi Lighthouse is out of commission. They don't plan to reopen it. Pohoiki Beacon is also not in commission right now. We see many lives lost due to our rugged coastline, and safety officials are unable to launch their boat from Pohoiki for rescues. Only helicopter missions can be done. Our Lavaia do not have any navigational beacon devices along our Puna coastline to help with identifying land, neither do our canoes. Some of them spend days on the ocean because they can't afford to, the gas to go back and forth every day. We have hosted many meetings in the past two uh, and a half years with our Levaya Ohana and community members. They're in support of opening up our boat ramp. The Levaya want the ramp opened up now. We are in support of DLNR Dober's application for the nationwide permit, asking for the EA, ex EA exemption to do the test dredge. Please don't wait, wait any longer to, um, than we already have. Please provide Dobor the support they need for the EA exemption application for the Army Corps of Engineers right away. Please help us dredge a channel now and get our Labaya back into the ocean and help us to feed our families and our community. I'd like to say thank you for your time and consideration and supporting our community in the recovery of our people here in Puna. Mahalo nui loa. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ikaika Marzu. I come from the district of uh, Kalapana, Hawaii, uh, Puna to be more general. Um, I've been a fisherman all my life, um, Lavaya from from shore onto the on, onto a new bigger game on 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 my boat, and also became a entrepreneur with our lava tours and employing all my family and and uh, extended family from Kalapana to share what we have experienced in the last thirty years of lava. So I come from a long line of um, fishermen, uh, farmers. Paniolo, musicians from Kalapana and Kapahu. And, you know, during the 1983 to 91, we lost majority of Kalapana. Not only the land we lost, but we lost our identity, our culture. And I was lucky and fortunate to grow up 
with that type of culture and, and learn about the stories from our kupuna. The generations after us, there's a there's an identity, lost of identity. So it's our stories shared with the next generation. That's how we continue on with our culture of Kalapana. Lava, again in 2018, has inundated our fishing village of Pohoiki. Pohoiki is different. You gotta be a really, really good fisherman. You gotta have, you gotta wanna, wanna fish. And every place else, I fished out of Hilo, it's a different style of fishing. I fished out of Kona, it's a different style of fishing. I fished out of Salt Point, it's a different style of fishing. We learned Pohiki style of fishing in that specific area from Kumukahi all the way to National Park, Apua Point, Keahu, Halape. We had our own style of fishing and we learned that from our kupunas. So again, it's happening again and an identity lost. We lost our culture because of the inundated. We wanna go back fishing. We wanna go back fishing how we were taught to do. You know, with this ramp away, economically, our, our, our home of Puna is suffering. Sustainability, our culture is being lost because a lot of the lava had inundated these areas. So we asked for help. Um, you know, a lot of my, my younger cousins wanna to, want to fish, wanna learn that style of fishing that was passed on from generations to generations. And now, it has stopped. So we we want we, we want to ask you guys as much as possible if you guys can help us as much as possible opening up this ramp as soon as possible so we can get back to fishing. It's really high cost because coming from Kalapana, we have to drive 36 miles with our boat all the way to Hilo. Then we have to pay another $200 to go around. It's a 60 mile run around to Pohoiki because that's the only place that we know how to fish. That's the only place that we have an advantage of above anyone else around our island. So, you know, we have been taught different places to fish for Onaga, for uh, Ahiko. Oh, this Ahiko is not biting today, but maybe the South Ko is biting today. So all of these, this knowledge is passed on to generations. We don't want to lose this knowledge. We want to pass it over to the next generation and the next generation further. So if we can ask for your help, um, uh, opening up this ramp as soon as possible. Mahalo for having me today. Uh, mahalo Finn for coming out on my boat and and uh, talking to the fishermen while we were out in the ocean, out, out in front of Pohoiki. Um, mahalo to Layla to grabbing a bull by the horn and, and help us, help our Levaya get back into the ocean. So mahalo everyone, thank you. And um, I'll be glad to hearing more from you guys. Mahalo. My name is Dane DuPont. I am a, the administrator of Y Tracker. I live in Leilani Estates, uh, about one street away from Fisher 8. And I'm here to support the dredging in the shortest amount of uh, realistic time. The dredging of Boiki, a channel, first and foremost, a channel to allow access for boats to return to the uh, sea. But secondly, a designated safe swim area. That's one of the things I wanted to talk about real briefly is the idea of swimming down there. Right now, that is one. Uh, so Poiki Beach, before the 2018 eruption, the lifeguards down there were responsible for Poiki Beach, Aohalanui Warm Pond, and a little bit of towards Kapoho. The eruption took Aohalanui and Kapoho, reducing the amount of uh, space that the lifeguards are supposed to patrol in half. So you'd expect that, oh, yeah, they, they less rescues. No, they doubled the amount of rescues. Why? This beach, it's dangerous. The currents there take a, not only a skilled boater, it takes a skilled swimmer that knows the ocean to be able to navigate it. It looks kind of calm and you know nice from up above, but what you're looking at is a lot of rock, really strong currents, rip tides, and it creates a, an illusion of uh, safety that the lifeguards basically have to sit down there and encourage people not to go in the water. So one of the things that Finn McCall uh, drew up in one of the original mock-ups for this whole, uh, dredging plan included a safe swim area there's out money allocated for a safe swim already uh that could be maybe ported over i'm not the um the person to ask about that but 
being able to allocate funding for a safe swim area where we have these warm ponds that have developed after the eruption down there where sand took the pockets that uh little bays and the sand came in washed in and created uh, tide pools those tide pools are now hot ponds uh heated from the groundwater they get uh, about hot tub temperature they these hot tub this hot tub temperature water could easily be uh, introduced into uh, the safe swim area, which connects into the channel. And that's one of the things I really think that it would create a boost to the economy, because we are talking about uh, the whole economy uh, in Pune with, when we're talking about Poiki. Not first by uh, being able to get the boaters back in the water, get tax revenue from the catch, all that kind of uh, local, uh, local injection of money into the community, but also by the tourists that come and see this beach, but can't, uh, but the, or maybe find out online that you can't swim there or it's dangerous to swim there. Or be, by being able to introduce this type of safe swim area and dredging the, when we dredge the uh, Poiki channel, it's two birds, one stone. So I would consider, uh, encourage first dredging the channel immediately. To, uh, making sure that we are able to get the boaters back into the water there but secondly consider the safe swim let's do when we got the equipment down there take out a little bit more sand make a swim area so then the the community's happy that don't care about the boaters but then the boaters are happy right and that's really what we're after here and that's kind of all i have to say kind of going to try and keep it brief and to that point um thank you well aloha and mahalo board my name is philip ong I'm a geologist uh, based in Volcano, um, also an educator and community consultant here in Pune. Uh, I've been consulting with the Pohuiki uh, boaters and Pune residents for ever since 2018 eruption. And you guys have heard there's lots of different facets of this, of this issue. And I'd like to kind of summarize that and then add my own geologic context here at the end. But you've, you've heard about subsistence and sustainability as key issues, uh, especially in crisis moves like during pandemic, being able to feed our people. We've heard about cultural traditions and the loss of cultural identity that we know in Hawaii is tied to place more so than, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a extremely evident in all our dealings, right? Uh, Pohuiki is, has a long cultural lineage that is being threatened by this breaking, breaking of it by the by loss, of, loss of voting there. So that's another facet you've heard already, already about by people much more expert in that than I. You've heard about the safety aspect, um, not just rescues, ocean access, uh, swim areas as well, right? I myself am a geologist. I'm going to bring you guys a little bit more geologic information here. So, you know, um, we've been monitoring the sand coming to Pohuiki Bay for some time. Um, through drone footage, we have maps, we've uh, made animations, all that is available online. The sand has stabilized over the last year and a half, and we do see variations that are present every beach in the world during seasonal variations in summer and winter. That still occurs, that's present everywhere. That is why largely every harbor and landing requires some maintenance and dredging from time to time. That's true everywhere. So to, to establish a goal of not needing any maintenance at a new Pohuiki project is unfeasible. Just wanna put that out there. Um, every harbor requires some level of maintenance. It's more, more a matter of what is a reasonable amount of maintenance, right? Okay, so that's the, that's the, the, the sand aspect of it. That's what you're de dealing with with these projects. Otherwise, the Pune area is known for having other geological hazards. The land subsides there. We've seen during earthquakes in 1975, 1960, 1924, 1840, over and over, the ground subsides. Any place you try to put in a new, new, a new facility is going to be subject to these hazards of the ground subsiding over time. You have to adopt for that in the long term. Pohuiki is a natural bay that forms there from a natural geological graben. It's That's why sand has collected there in the past. It was once known as Oneloa. The sand comes and goes over time. That's natural. Um, that's the place. There's a cultural reason. There's a geologic reason. That is the place. There are other hazards. The, the sea cliff along most of Puna is, is inaccessible by water because it's cliff. And that cliff forms from the actual erosion, the geologic spalling of the sea cliff. That is also going to occur anywhere along the Nulapa Delta, anywhere else. That's just true. That's just also part of the Puna, Puna geologic hazard, right? Dealing with Pohuiki, you avoid, avoid those two hazards. You now you might say, well, maybe we go to some of the old coastline where it's already stabilized. Well, now you're dealing with the cultural and archaeological issues. Every place that's green on that Puna coastline has a long cultural history and tradition, and you're going to have to uh, deal with environmental and cultural impacts of trying to even consider putting anything there. 
So, you know, that's, that's not worth, not worthwhile. So kind of in summary, you know, uh, Pohuiki does have some geological risks, but it has reasonable geological risks. Dredging is a reasonable risk. Uh, it's a maintenance that we, that we, we consider reasonable in other harbors in the state. Um, and anywhere else you might put in a new project that would take longer and cost more money. It also is subject to more geologic hazards. Mahalo for your time. Have you started informal discussions with the Army Corps with regard to the option of, of utilizing the existing um, environmental um, uh, exemptions? Yes, yeah, we've, we've had uh, uh, several meetings with them and that they're open to it. Um, of course, they, they told us that um, you know, they couldn't make a determination until we actually submitted a, a permit application. Um, and so in addition to submitting the permit application, we need to come up with some conceptual plans that require some level of engineering um, that we'd have to incorporate into our, uh, our consultant's contract. Um, but yes, that they're, they're definitely uh, have, have seemed open to it. And, um, and, and from our discussions and meetings with them, um, they think that it, it's, it's a possibility. Mr. Ong, did you have some information to add to that? Yes, Mahalo, yeah. I just wanted to address, you know, so the, the issue of uh, expediency in large part has to do with whether we can have an exemption for these, these exemptions actually go through or not. And I just wanted to address, there was a recent article in the media in the Civil Beat about the fact that uh, the project could maybe cannot be exempted because its current use is actually a beach and not a boat ramp. And I just want to point out that, that seems to the public to be a circular argument because of, of trying to follow the process the, uh, outlined by the state to, to, to uh, responsibly uh, uh, reestablish the boat ramp. It takes a certain amount of time to say that that amount of time, because the state hasn't taken any steps yet, therefore it cannot take any further steps, is a circular argument. So we just want to put that out there for you know uh, civil beat. Um, that's that's the real issue: is can we get these exemptions or not? And you know I just want to point out the fallacy in that argument. Thank Mahalo. you.